therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition so you will not grow weary and lose heart. guys here and a welcome to those of you guys who are joining us online. Um, so this morning I was trying to figure out just what to kind of say in this welcome and wanted to send out a little bit of a challenge to you guys this morning. You know, come to church and on Sunday morning and get ready to, yeah, be challenged and think, think through some things. Um, this Wednesday during the church Bible study um, on Wednesday nights here, uh, we were talking, just, we just kind of touched the surface on spiritual gifts. It was, it was actually a really um, exciting and empowering talk to discuss how, how God has given each of us a special gift that we can use to bring him glory and to love each other and to, and to ultimately love him. Um, it was so exciting for me to think that we each have a unique um, spiritual gift that when we work together, we create just this beautiful um, body working together. Or I, I kept on picturing a beautiful painting and how with just one color, a painting is not really that incredible. But when you start to add and layer colors and different, different people's gifts together, you create just this amazing, beautiful work of art. And God has given us these gifts, and, and we're each unique, and that's how we create our own um, beautiful masterpiece. Um, so there's a lot, of, lot to learn about what a spiritual gift is, and it's something that I haven't personally done a lot of digging in, but the Bible really makes it clear that the gifts were given to us to use. God gave them to us so that we can practice them. Um, and it feels really relevant, um, especially as we are going to hopefully be able to soon gather more of us together, that we can really start to work together and figure that out. Um, so my challenge for you this morning is um, to, to pray and ask God to reveal to you what your spiritual gift is, or if you already know what it is, um, how to use it, how to um, put it, that into practice this week. Um, and for now then, I'm just gonna open in prayer. God, thank you so much that you, you created us as one body with all of these unique Hearts. Thank you that none of us are the same and we all have different ideas and um, skill sets and even though sometimes that can can cause friction, ultimately when we learn to work together it, it creates beauty and it, um, it just creates your kingdom here on earth and we just thank you so much for that blessing. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this morning that we can gather here together and um, I just pray that you would just be at the center of everything that is said today um, and that you would, you would work on each of our hearts um, just to bring us closer to you and that we would just, yeah, that we would uh, have a, a great desire to spend more and more time with you and get to know you better. We just thank you for this morning. Amen. Um, and you guys can stand. I think there's going to be singing here, right?
stories of the Bible. The parable of the farmer. This is Jesus. Hey -o! Who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He healed many people from their sickness, performed many miracles like calming storms, and even raised people from the dead. One day, Jesus went and sat beside the sea. A great crowd gathered around him. Oh, hey, everyone. So he got in a boat and told them many things in parables. Okay, listen to this. He told them this story. A farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil among rocks. The seed began to grow quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still, other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. When Jesus had said this, he called out, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Yeah. Later, the disciples came to Jesus and asked what this parable meant. Jesus said, The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message, only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are treated badly for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the desire for other things. And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even a hundred times as much as had been planted. Good morning. It is such a privilege to be here. Um, one thing that I have really, have really missed coming to church in the last couple of months sometimes when I'm unable to come and um, it's just really impressed on me and what a privilege it is to be able to be here. Um, I was going to read scripture this morning um, last week and the week before <laughs> and a few things came up and at that time I was planning to read from Ephesians chapter 6. I was going to read about the armor of God so if that's something that you need to hear this morning then please look it up but um, God changed my mind <laughs> and um, we, I had a conversation this week with some friends and we were talking about how um, this past year has um, brought about kind of a, I don't know, a negative um, sort of feeling to everything and, and there's a lot of discouragement out there and a lot of um, people that are afraid and all these things and I don't want to illegitimize that because I think that that is important to feel all the feelings that you're feeling. But I think that, you know, in worship, I was talking with this, these friends, Kim and I were both having a discussion about worship and the lament in our worship and how lament is a really important part of our worship, but how we can't stay there and we need to move past that and we need to move forward into, into joy. And, um, and joy is different from happiness and that's a whole nother conversation. But um, we have such good news that we want to share, we need to share with those around us. And I think we can't forget 
about this good news, and that's the reason why we're here, that we serve a living Savior. And so I'm going to read a passage that is not very normal to read this time of year. Um, it's from Luke chapter 2, and it's about the birth of Jesus, um, starting in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. And I would be too. <laughs> but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, it, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. Yeah, isn't that great? We, our Savior is, is born. He has saved us. Um, so for our family life portion today, I'm just going to highlight a few of the things in the bulletin. Um, if you're here, you may have it in front of you or um, at home. It should be um, being sent to you in an email. Um, so yeah, uh, just a, a few, few highlights. Um, I just really uh, want to send out our condolences to um, to Ray and Loretta and Lanny and Shauna and Larry and Marcy um, of their on the passing of their brother and brother-in-law um, or yeah sorry their brother-in-law uh, Ron Dirksen uh, he was a close family friend to us as well and I just I know there's just so much hurt going on there right now and so yeah we will definitely be keeping keeping the family in our prayers um, also there is is, is youth in person starting this week? Yes? Okay, the plan is for youth to, to be back back here at the church on Thursday, which is really exciting. They moved to online for a little bit, just while well, things were kind of crazy there, and so it's really exciting to, to be back in, in person for that. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'm gonna highlight for right now. You guys can look in the bulletin to see what else is going on um, during the week, and I'm just gonna, gonna pray right now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that, um, yeah, for this, this family of believers, and Lord, we just, there's, there's pain in, in, and joy in, in, within this family, and we just want to, we want to bring, bring those joys, and thank you, and we want to bring those pains, and ask that you would, you would bring your comfort and your love. Um, I just really want to pray for, um, the Dirksen family, and for those, um, those who are close to, to them, and um, just just be with them in a special way, Lord. Um, bring comfort and bring hope. And um, we thank you that Ron loved you, and he left a legacy of of your love with those those who he has left behind here. Um, Lord, I pray that you would be with with Mar Jansen um, as she is recovering after her surgery. Um, yeah, just be with her and, um, and with her husband, just, yeah, bless them, and, um, I also pray that you would be with, with Annie, um, also just bringing, bringing that comfort, God, bring that, um, just that embrace, brace for her, um, after her brother passed away, um, and we pray for, for our church family members, for Larry and Marcy, and for Steve and Liz and their boys, I pray that you would be with them. Um, God, I pray that they would just be seeking after you and and just, yeah, feeling your love and, and loving you, Lord. Um, I pray that uh, our youth events would, would be able to, yeah, come back and be in person. I pray that you would be with the youth in our community. Thank you for Owen, and thank you for the time that he has invested in these kids. And, yeah, I just pray that... That they would just constantly um, be be drawn towards you, Lord. And there's so many other ways that they can go. I just pray that um, there would just be a light that they would be drawn to, um, coming to youth. And and I pray that you would put people in their lives that that would show them how to how to walk alongside of you, um, Lord. We just thank you for this morning. I pray that you would be with Pastor Kim as he comes up and and shares a message with us. I pray that we would have have 
ears to hear what you are wanting to say for him today. We thank you so much for loving us, and Lord, we love you. Amen. So I am uh, Pastor Kim today. No, I'm Owen. Uh, welcome here, everybody. Happy Sunday. I need a unmute the mic. This helps. Hey, there we go. Oh, and mask. Yeah, there we go. Happy Sunday, everybody. Uh, yesterday, spent quite a bit of time in the garden. Uh, gardening, not just getting a farm, farmer's tan. Um, it's, it's crazy how warm it is right now. Kind of unprecedented in my experience so far in May in Saskatchewan. Um, we went to the city as well, and we did a group of our, our, from our church, we did uh, some garbage pickup in the downtown area, and it was awesome to kind of fellowship together, get to know each other bit better in, in service, and then also you get to learn firsthand how uh, the inner city, um, how it works, and, and how, how we can pray for people, right? So I would really encourage you guys each, I think it's every other week we are meeting, uh, we meet down uh, 20th Street Avenue K, and we're, we're there to, to help people, um, we're connecting with Trace and Tracy Block, uh, they moved out. That's Parker and Rachel Block, their kids. Uh, they moved out, when was that? Like a month ago? Or not a month ago. Like eight, October. Yeah, months, hey? Uh, in October. So they've been serving there and, and living missionally in, uh, in Saskatoon. And that's something that I think I, I, I'm so honored by their faithfulness and commitment to saying yes to God. And so we get to see firsthand how, uh, how to help people in our community, in our surrounding communities. So I'd really encourage you guys, if you, if you are able to, every other Saturday we're, we're meeting down there. So um, expand your world a bit. Get out of your comfort zone. It, it's good for us. Um, before I get started, let's start off with some prayer, because that's a good place to start. Pray with me. God, thank you for who you are, a God of, of peace, a God that calls order out of chaos. God, we pray for um, our hearts, Lord. God, help us to just be um, sensitive to your Spirit's guiding and, and your Spirit's leading. Um, pray for me as, as uh, God, just give me the clarity that needs to be uh, communicated here. God, I pray a blessing over the rest of our service. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1999, the cult classic movie, The Matrix, was released. In the film, there's an iconic scene where the main character, Neo, is offered the choice between a red pill and a blue pill by the rebel leader, Morpheus. Morpheus shows Neo that all of humanity is hooked up to and living in a computer simulation. What Neo thought to be reality was all a computer program. What Neo thought was reality was fake. Upon learning this, uh, Morpheus gives Neo the op option of being unplugged from the computer program. He gives him the choice of a red pill and a blue pill. To choose the red pill, is to disconnect from the simulation, from the program. This disconnection represents an uncertain future. Upon being disconnected, Neo would enter into a new reality, which is reality itself, not a fake. A major problem exists, though. In this reality, it more resembles a hellscape than the computer simulation of uh, seemingly um, 
peace. Reality itself in Neo's, in, in this movie, uh, is, is difficult. The people that are disconnected from the computer simulation are hunted after by machines. They must fight to survive. They have to hide. They're chased. Life inside the computer program offers escape and the illusion of freedom. Like a hamster running in a wheel. Living in the real world for Neo is harsh, difficult, but free. Neo is offered blue pill or red pill. The blue pill represents a choice of willful ignorance, an option of continuance of living in the computer simulation, ignoring the real battle that is taking place in reality. As Morpheus describes, you take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. This is a decision that we as humanity have often. Like it or not, we live in a world that is at war. We have a red pill, blue pill decision to make. We can pretend that everything is okay, or we can stand up to the powers that seek to destroy us. We need to resist temptation by following the one who defeats the powers of Satan, sin, and death. Two weeks ago, Pastor Kim started us off with the first part of our three-part sermon on the temptation of Christ. Today is part two. Our scripture is found in Luke chapter 4, verse 5 to 8. And I'm going to give just a, a brief background so that we can understand what's going on in these verses. So before these verses, Jesus goes into the desert. Before he goes into the desert, he is baptized. The Spirit comes down on him, and God speaks to, to Jesus, saying, This is my Son, with whom I am well pleased. It's a pinnacle moment for Jesus. It's an affirmation of Jesus' purpose on earth, of why, he's, why he's here. After Jesus' baptism, He's taken uh, into the desert by the Holy Spirit. And for 40 days, he fasts. He fasts and prays. Last week, uh, two weeks ago, Pastor Kim talked about Jesus' temptation to turn the stones into bread. Because if you're like me, after one hour of not eating, I get hungry, right? So imagine 40 days, right? So Jesus is incredibly hungry, right? And so Satan's temptation is accurate. Right? Turn these stones into bread. Because guess what? After 40 days of hunger, you want bread. You want anything. Right? And so Satan tempts him uh, to turn these stones into bread. Um, Satan calls into question Jesus' sonship. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Right? He calls immediately, calls into question his identity. So Satan draws on his human hunger and he twists scripture to trick Jesus. Amidst Jesus' hunger, Je Jesus refutes Satan with scripture. He refutes Satan with truth. Now we're back to our verses here, verse 5 to 8 here. And so what I want to do, I want to encourage you guys, let's, as we read this, let's, let's try to put ourselves in the first-hand setting. So we're observing this as, as it's happening, okay? So let's, let's try to imagine this as it's happening, as if we're there. So let's read Luke 4, verse 5 to 8. It's on the slide there. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Okay, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. There's a lot going on in these very few verses. 
So let's, let's shake out the tree and see what we can see, okay? So the first thing that I notice is verses 5 to 6 is the temptation, okay? So that's, that's uh, one of the points we're going to cover today. And then the other thing that I see is worship is greater than temptation. I think that's the mathematical sign for greater than. I'm not sure on the slide there. I'm pretty sure. Is it? We're good? Yeah. Worship is greater than temptation. Okay. So let's look at these. Let's pause and reflect on what is temptation. Temptation is a compulsion or idea to follow a way different than what God has set before us. Temptation is not itself a sin, but falling into temptation is. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, or like Israel at Mount Sinai. Where does temptation come from? That seems pretty obvious. We have an enemy that wants to destroy us. John 10.10. 10. It's one of my favorite verses because it really shows the reality we live in. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they might have life and life to the full. Okay? We have an enemy that wants to get us on a different path than what God has for us. This is what temptation is. It's an alternative to what God has intended. This is what Satan offers Jesus. Jesus' temptation is its pretty straightforward. If Jesus worships Satan, Satan will give his claim over the nations. The temptation Jesus is facing is that of worldly power. This verse brings up some questions for me, though. So, does Satan have the authority to be giving? Does he, does he even own that power? Or is he lying about that power? Does he have the authority to give Jesus the, the nation's authority and splendor? And the answer is kind of. Let me explain. So the world did not technically belong to the devil. He owned human hearts and the societies only as the usurper, okay? Satan is a thief, right? Satan is the deceiver, right? So he's, he's taken, he's stolen power that doesn't belong to him. Let's look at some scripture references. John 12, 31 says, Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, Okay? John 14, verse 30. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. John 16, verse 11. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So the most that Satan can do is make Jesus a political or military sort of Messiah that Honestly, most of the Jewish people, they expected a military, political sort of Messiah. They were anticipating that. So Satan gives Jesus an option of earthly power, of kingdom power. Earthly power. So what does it gain Jesus to have authority and splendor of all the nations? Jesus didn't grow up in a vacuum. He would have had a full understanding of the people's expectation of a conquering militaristic king. He had full understanding of that. This is what his family expected. This is what his disciples expected. This is what they expected up until they saw him hanging on a cross. They expected Jesus to be a militaristic conquering king. Rome was brutal. They taxed Israel brutally. They killed Israel brutally. Jesus would have no doubt had negative experiences with the empire of Rome. Conquering Rome would have crossed his mind. When injustice happens to you, you want, it's human 
instinct to lash out to get your vengeance. But Jesus has another plan. With 40 days in the, in the desert, Jesus is undoubtedly thinking through what sort of Messiah he is going to be. Satan's temptation is not blind, it's accurate. Satan's temptation with, with food was, was direct. He had hunger. Satan's temptation with power is direct. There's, there's a human aspect of desiring power. When power is offered to humanity, what do we do? What do we do? We take that power. We seize it quickly. Vacant power is taken very quickly. That's a human instinct. In this moment, Satan is offering Jesus the blue pill of ignorance. He's giving Jesus the easy way out. He can destroy Rome and rule as king. Let's imagine for a second, we're there on the mountaintop with Jesus, observing everything that's going on. In a flash, you see all of the glory and splendor of the nations around you. You see it firsthand. All of the perks of the business is offered. Power, wealth, prominence. Imagine with us for a second, what if Jesus had taken that blue pill? What if Jesus had taken that opportunity of vacant power? What sort of history book would have been written about Emperor Jesus who overthrew Rome? Think of what sort of nation Jesus could have formed had he chosen the crown of gold instead of the crown of thorns. Think of all the good he could have done in 70 years of life instead of just the short 33. What sort of hopeful empire he could have established in that time. The social justice that could have been, been delivered. But this earthly empire would not last. Without resurrection, the kingdom ends. Victory cannot be won by these earthly methods. Jesus recognizes that through this compromise of worshiping Satan, he would then take on another, he would defeat Rome, but take on the other evil of worshiping another god, which we're clearly shown not to do. Jesus turns aside this temptation by re referencing scripture. And in verse, verse 8, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus' rejection of worldly power leads him down the road to the cross. Jesus recognizes that Rome is not the true occupier. He's, Rome is not the oppressor of humanity. Like Neo in our illustration at the start, Jesus has the red pill. Jesus chooses the red pill and chooses to fight the powers of Satan, sin, and death. Jesus chooses to fight these forces of evil. He rejects the notion of the militant Messiah. Rather, he chooses the path of suffering on the cross. This, this path is set for him from the beginning. In Genesis 3.15, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Right? Isaiah uh, 53, verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus counters the temptation Satan offers with scripture. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus shows us how to combat temptation. Worship is greater than temptation. Jesus shows us worshiping and serving God is greater than temptation. And we are called to do likewise. When we worship and serve God, we see his beauty. We see his splendor and goodness, and we remember his love and grace towards us. Our focus is drawn away from ourselves and towards the Holy One. 
our hearts are warmed, and we realize that we're contemplating exchanging the glory of God for something temporary. We're, we're trading it, God, for dust. What the, te- what the devil promises us is temporary, but the cost is eternal loss. When we sin as humanity, when we sin, it's because we take our eyes off of God. When we worship something, we serve it. We fixate on it. We give it our devotion, our affection, and our time. What we spend our time on usually shows us what we are choosing to worship. So, what are we choosing to worship? Spend a second and think about that. What are we choosing to put before God? What do you fixate on? Give devotion to? Give affection to? What are these things? If you're like me, it's probably yourself. I am selfish. I am self-serving. And I do not like sacrifice. I want the world to benefit me, not the other way around. And I think this is our prevailing issue in our Western world. We worship ourselves. You look at how our world is set up. It's, it's built around comfort and security. While comfort and security aren't directly long, wrong, but again, we, we, we fixate on it. We, we draw our attention off of what God has called us to do, and we go back to our comfort. If, if we ever feel called out, it's scary. I don't want that. I'm going to go back and hide. And I think that's actually that's suffocating us as Christians. I think we're, we're suffocating because rather than doing what God says, I'm just going to live my life in this convenient space because that's scary. Right? And, and it, it's, it's not directly, we're not bowing down to ourselves, but our hearts, what are our hearts doing? My old pastor um, in Grand Prairie, he had a saying, and I've said it before, I'll say it a lot because it's an awesome saying. So our world is set up like this. Okay? So get all you can can all you get, and then sit on the can. Okay? Get all you can, can all you get, and then sit on the can. That's how our world's set up. Right? We we have this mentality of of more, more, more. Right? And I think that's something that stuff isn't wrong, but I think, again, this, this, this more, 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 it ends up We worship ourselves and we become suffocated as Christians in our world. This leads us to death. And we see it all around us. Our world is in turmoil and our hearts are boiling over. We know that things are not all right. We know. We see it. We feel it. As humanity, this happens all throughout Scripture. This happens all throughout history. When we follow what's right in our own eyes, we are led astray. We're led towards destruction. The blue pill of ignorance, of willful ignorance, is very easy to swallow. It's sweet and it tastes real good. It's nice to live in the fantasy world that, that we're oblivious to the real battle that's at hand. We isolate ourselves from people that are suffering. And that sucks. That's hard. Right? Because there's a real world out there. We can pretend that everything's okay. Or we can stand up to the powers that seek to destroy us. We need to resist temptation by following the one who defeats it. Right? Jesus defeats Satan's sin and death. 
as Neo from the Matrix had a choice, as Jesus on the mountain had a choice, we too have a choice today. We have this choice every day. Who are you going to worship and serve? Is it yourself or is it God? Blue pill, red pill. Who are we going to worship and serve? I want, I want to just sit on that question. It's between you and God right now. Who are you going to worship and serve? Spend a, a minute in that. So this is, this is tough, right? Because we, we, we have these options in life. And so often we just kind of, we don't intentionally make a choice. We just kind of live life and it just kind of happens, right? We unintentionally coast through life. And guys, I want to encourage you to, to, to choose to understand and choose to follow God. And, and the Christian life can, can seem easy, but when we live out what Jesus does, that's hard, right? Living out what, what Christ instructs us to do, that's hard. And it's, it's actually impossible, right? On a human level, it's impossible, right? It's the only way we can live out this Christian life is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? That's the only way. We live our lives through the power that Jesus gives us. He is the one who wins the victory, not us. Right? When we, when we have our, our gaze focused on God, we will experience temptations. But you know what? When our eyes are focused on God, we're not saying, what do I want? But Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not my will, your will, Lord. And so through, through following and focusing your gaze on Jesus, you walk through these temptations. You walk in relationship with the one that made us, right? The, the, the one that made the stars wants to walk in relationship with you. Let's, let's call a spade a spade. Let's, let's identify counterfeits when we see them, right? When, when we're following the wrong way, let's identify that. And let's, let's repent of it. Let's say, Lord, help me follow you. Right? It's not through my power, it's through your power. And, and through these, this heart of surrender, that's how the, the good news is spread. Right? That's how uh, we walk in obedience with God, in relationship, step by step with God. So I want to encourage you, don't fall for the counterfeit blue pill. Right? Don't be willfully ignorant. But choose to follow the one who has, who has made life and sustained it. I'm going to close in, in prayer, and then that will conclude the service. But join me with, in prayer here. God, thank you for your, your good news that um, the grave, grave has been robbed. Um, death has been defeated. The thing that held us down no longer does. God, help us live in the freedom that you have, have to offer us. Help us to learn to not live off of our own strength, but off of the one, the one uh, who, who makes everything possible. God, help us to have hearts of surrender. Help us to be honest with ourselves and honest before you, God. Pray that um, we would just, um, yeah, help, help this to sit in our hearts, God. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move and, and change in, in us and also in the world around us. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Uh, have a great Sunday. Enjoy. I think it's going to be sunny, but I have no idea. But enjoy it. Have a good one.